Hi everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. On today's video, we're going to be looking at a computer from 1977 and how we can improve it. Yes, it's the PET 2001. Let's get right to it. Now, throughout most of our lives, you've probably heard the message that no matter what you do programming a computer, you can never physically harm it. So it's safe to push any key or do anything on a machine, and you're not going to damage it. Well, you might have heard of something called the killer poke. Now, when we're talking about poke, we're not talking about physically pushing on something. We're talking about the basic command poke, which is one that allows you to set a particular memory location to a particular value. The opposite of poke is peak, which reads the memory value and you can either print it or set it as a variable. Now on the early Commodore PETs, like this 2001-8, which was released in 1977, there was a special poke and value combination you could use to speed up the graphics or text update rate on the screen, potentially increasing the performance by a factor of two. Such a poke sounds a little bit too good to be true, but it actually works, and we'll get to performance testing in a second. Now the term killer poke came from the idea that allegedly using that poke command on later Commodore PET models could physically damage the CRT monitor on them. But on these early models, it was perfectly safe to use that poke. First, let's take a look at how that poke works on my PET 2001. This is the same PET 2001 you've seen in my previous PET restoration videos, and it's completely a bone stock machine with no modifications other than that I added heat sinks onto various chips. Let's try out the poke and see what happens. When I hit enter, nothing should happen at all except the performance of the computer should be increased by potentially 2x. But something's wrong. When I do this poke on my pet, I actually get a black screen. And the only way for me to recover out of it is to power cycle the machine. So this is very unusual that it doesn't work on my pet. Like I mentioned before, this machine is completely stock and unmodified, and this is definitely the right poke, and it should work on this machine. So to understand that better, let's take a look at the schematics so to better understand what actually is going on when you issue this poke command. So when the killer poke is executed, which is setting value 62 to this memory location 59458, What's happening is it's actually changing what this pin 15 does on this 6522 VIA chip. VIA stands for Versatile Interface Adapter, and this chip is attached to the data and address bus on the PET and allows the CPU to have extra input and outputs. The relevant pin we're dealing with is pin 15, otherwise known as PB5. This is configured as an input by the computer when you first power it up. And if I move my post-it note out of the way, you'll see here that pin 15 is labeled as sync, and the signal comes off from the bottom of the schematic here. Now the next logical question is, what is the sync signal exactly? Well, it turns out it's the 60 hertz vertical refresh signal that eventually makes its way into the monitor. As I mentioned, PB15 is configured as an input, and what that allows this chip to do is monitor that sync signal, watching it for changes in state. If we take a look at the signal on the oscilloscope, pulses are occurring 60 times a second that are perfectly in line with the vertical refresh of the monitor. This is used for a very specific function on these pets. Due to the architecture of this particular machine, when the CPU wants to change what's displayed on screen, if it does it normally, you will get static or snow on the screen. So to avoid that, what Commodore did is they had the kernel on this machine wait for the vertical refresh to happen, and then it would update the video memory. That would ensure that all changes to the screen were happening while it wasn't being drawn. Therefore, you wouldn't see the static. Unfortunately, this comes with the performance penalty of making the CPU sit there and wait for the vertical refresh to happen before it updates the video memory. And while the vertical refresh actually is happening 60 times a second, that's actually relatively slow compared to the one megahertz speed of this machine. So back on the schematics, let's take a look at what happens when we issue the killer poke. 
As I mentioned before, pin 15 on the 6522 is actually an input. And this is watching for that sync signal to come into this chip. And this is what allows the CPU to read it so it can wait for the appropriate time to access the memory. Issuing this particular poke actually changes pin 15 from an input to an output. And it also sets it to be low or grounded. And what that has the effect of doing is whatever signal is on this line here labeled sync is now gonna be grounded through the 6522. Let's follow the sync signal back to the source to see what exactly is being grounded. Here's the sync signal on a different page and this is what's feeding the 6522. You'll notice a junction right here and it feeds up here to this gate 74LS20 which actually is what's generating the sync signal that goes to the monitor. This is the connection that goes to the screen itself. But this is an input on this gate. So let's keep following this back. We follow it over to here to this junction and up to this chip right here, which is a 74 LS08, pin eight is the output of that gate. And this is the signal that is getting grounded by the 6522 when we issue the killer poke. You'll notice here it's labeled video on. This has two functions, both to generate that 60 Hertz sync signal, but also to control whether the CRT is on or off. What that means is while the monitor is doing its vertical sync 60 times a second, it actually briefly turns off the picture. I mentioned before that this poke is well known to work on these machines. So my particular machine is somewhat of an outlier. Now I can't say for sure if it ever worked on this machine or not, but it does seem like a bad thing to do to one of these pets. You are literally shorting that 7408 to ground, which can't be good for that chip. Perhaps over the lifetime of its machine, the killer poke was used a lot, which damaged that 7408. This is the 7408 chip right here. And as you notice, it is soldered onto the motherboard. So it's not something I can just easily swap out to test a different one. And it is the original 1977 part, as is the original VIA chip up here. The reason my screen is blanking out when I issue the killer poke is because the 7408 is not strong enough to fight against the grounding. And remember I mentioned on the schematics, it said video on for the output of that chip. Well, what's happening is the signal is going off to another component on the motherboard. And that component is strictly seeing a ground all the time. And because of that, the screen just gets blanked entirely. I think the way the killer poke is supposed to work is the 7522 and the 7408 will fight against each other and it will result of a signal that's perhaps 2.5 volts and ground, which is enough for the other chips on the motherboard to see it as a correct syncing pulse, but the 6522 itself is always gonna see ground. So as the operating system waits for the vertical refresh to happen, it's looking for that signal to be grounded and then it will update the screen. Well it's always gonna see a grounded signal all the time, which means it will never wait for the vertical refresh to happen. This has the effect of speeding up the computer, but also it will generate that snow that I mentioned. But I think clearly the snow was a small trade-off to pay for the much increased performance you would get on the video subsystem. But not all is lost for the killer poke on this machine. With a simple hardware mod, we can permanently enable the killer poke on this machine which will allow us to compare A to B, the performance of the video subsystem with and without the killer poke. First, let's do some tests to see how fast this video subsystem is in its stock configuration. Shelby wrote a short test program that we're gonna to use to see how fast it displays some text on the screen. Let's load that. What Shelby's program is gonna do is print a bunch of text on screen as it's doing now, and it's gonna count up the amount of time it takes to display it all. I'm gonna run it three times and then we'll take an average over the results and we'll use that as the baseline stock performance of this machine. As you'll notice, there's no snow here, although there is this flashing, which is normal for these pets whenever the screen scrolls, but no snow otherwise. 1,459 ticks. We'll run that a second time. We got the same result, 1,459 ticks. And one more run, 1,459 ticks. We got the same exact performance for all three runs. So to permanently enable the killer poke on this machine, what we need to make sure happens is that 6522 is always seeing a ground signal. But we need to do it 
without upsetting the output of the 7408, which makes sure that the screen receives its sync signal and also doesn't go blank. The way I'm gonna accomplish that is by taking another 6522 and bending out pin 15 and then attaching it using a small clip wire I've built here to ground. And I'm doing that through a 460 ohm resistor and that will ensure that this signal always sees a ground signal on its input. Incidentally, I decided to use another chip because I didn't want to go bending the pin out on my original 1977 6522. This is a much later chip from 1989 where I'm not so concerned if I accidentally broke that pin off. So there's not much to this particular mod. This is 6522 I need to pull out. There it is, the original 1977 MOS part. With the replacement chip, I've already bent out the leg and attached the clip to it. I'm just gonna stick this in the socket. Now where to connect this ground to, it turns out that this capacitor right here is a bypass cap and this leg that is closest to the camera, closest to the front of the computer, is actually ground. So this is where we need to connect this clip to. Incidentally, one of the reasons for the resistor is if this 6522 ever gets configured to be output on pin 15 and it gets set to high or five volts, at least there's a resistor, so it's not a direct short between five volts and ground. Let's give it a power up. So all looks normal on the computer. If I type some letters on here, everything seems to be pretty much normal. But if you noticed when I hit enter, there was a little bit of static there. You see that? You might not be able to see it very clearly on the camera, but definitely there's a little bit of static that displays as it updates the video memory. Let me load Shelby's test program. And there it goes. Now you see the static displaying here as it scrolls, but you can right away see how much faster it's running right now than it was the first time. So we got 704 ticks with the killer poke permanently engaged. This is compared to 1,459 last time around. Let me run this three times just to get a consistent reading. 709 ticks. And the final result is 709 ticks. And when we average all three on the second run, we get 707 ticks. So with a simple calculation, we can see that we have 106% speed increase by doing this permanent killer poke. And honestly, the side effect of just some slight static seems like a small price to pay for a massive speed increase. I find it amusing that it was on later pets that the killer poke was supposed to be the killer and damage your monitor, while in reality, it's on these early machines, at least mine, that when you issue the killer poke, it actually could damage components on your motherboard. So I'm quite pleased that this modification with the wire and the resistor permanently and gives me the speed increase and does it safely without any risk of damage to the computer. That leads me to the next oddity with this machine, and you might have noticed it while I was working on the killer poke segment. When I turn off the power, there's a white dot that appears in the center of the screen after the power is shut off that then fades away. In previous videos where I'd worked on this pet and people had noticed that dot briefly show up on my video, I had a few comments from people saying that my CRT was close to death or had a problem and needed to be repaired. I am far from an expert on CRT, so me being confident and being able to say that there's nothing physically wrong with my monitor or not is not something I'm really able to do. I do recall as a child though, seeing other black and white TVs from the 70s and the 60s that also exhibited that dot when you powered off the power when you were finished watching television. So I didn't feel that this was a problem with this monitor specifically, as this was a design from the 70s. I happen to have a friend who's very knowledgeable about Commodore PETs, but also the analog circuitry that's used inside of these monitors. And that's Frank at the YouTube channel IZ8DWF. So I reached out to him and asked him if his pets have the same dot issue as mine, but also if he could do some analysis and figure out why that dot is appearing and if it's actually a fault, like a failure in the monitor or something that we could actually fix. Hi, Heidi, and, and thank you for asking. This will give me the right excuse to finally fix a pet, the 2001 and this one, which has the same monitor revision as the 2001 anyway. Let's see why it happens. Um, learn if we can fix it. So let's power it down. We see briefly the, the, the scan collapse and here is the dot. The bright dot. And it takes a 
quite a lot to extinguish and becomes very bright anyway. So before we start diving into the schematics, let me tell you that I believe this spot is not extremely dangerous for the CRT. It's caused by the stored charge into the CRT internal anode capacitor. But at this point, the high voltage supply has really been turned off. However, I think it's a good idea to try to eliminate it entirely if possible. As in almost all CRT raster scan systems, the high voltage supply is generated by the horizontal deflection circuit. But as we can see in this uh, steel frame, both the vertical and horizontal scan collapse as soon as we cut the power to the pad. Uh, so this means the uh, high voltage is not anymore generated. Uh, but from now on, an electron that can find its way to the front of the screen will end in a tiny spot in the dead center. So let's see what set of conditions must exist for the spot to appear. This is part of the schematic of the 2001 Mordor circuit. First, we need some anode high voltage and indeed some small charge always remains stored into the uh, CRT capacitor. This is a very tiny charge, but if we dump it all in the same spot, it will be very bright, as we have seen. Second, we need a hot cathode that can emit electrons. In this monitor, the cathode heater filament is powered by the main 12 volt supply and not from a secondary supply generated from the flyback transformer. Also, the 12 volt supply is the biggest capacitor of the whole circuit, and since all the raster scan and the flyback circuits are already stopped working, the whole stored charge in the main supply capacitor will almost all discharge through the heater, keeping the cathode hot for tens of seconds at least. All other voltage rates are generated by the flyback transformer, in particular the 33 volts cathode bias and the minus 30 volts control grid bias that are now both missing. So there is no voltage cutoff between the cathode uh, and the grid one to stop the electrons from flying through and towards the screen. But this can happen only if one last condition exists. This last condition is an open path to ground for the current that must flow from the cathode for the electrons to be emitted. Also, this last condition is more likely the only one we can change to eliminate the spot. In fact, there is no way to prevent some charge to remain in the anode capacitor or for the 12 volt supply to discharge elsewhere, or for a cutoff bias to appear out of nothing when the deflection circuits have stopped working. So, let's examine how the cathode current finds a way to ground. In its path, the current will find first R7 and R6, and it's not a problem to cross them. Then, Q3 is out of play entirely, because the current would go against the emitter arrow, and that's impossible in this case. But CR6 is in the right way for the current direction. At this point, all ways from uh, R4 are blocked as the boost supply comes from the flyback and there's no way to ground there. Capacitor also can't be crossed by a direct current. CR5 is in the wrong way too, so all depends on Q2. If Q2 is for some reason turned on, that's the only possible way to ground and also the only possible area for a fix. Now, the only way to turn Q2 on is the first turn off Q1 that's holding Q2 base low and after that have still sufficient voltage on the 12 volt supply for Q2 to go into conduction. Q1 can be turned off by the PET video signal but by now our PET is off and can't do really anything. But since Q1 has a resistor from its base to ground it will turn off alone when its base voltage becomes less than 0.6 volt. If we do the math, Q1 turns off when 12 volt ray reaches more or less 7.7 volts. Q2 instead has not any base resistor to ground. Again, with simple math we find that Q2 can still barely turn on for a voltage as low as 1.2 volts. So at about 7.7 volts Q1 goes off and Q2 will happily turn on and give our cathode current a highway to ground. So there you have it. Thanks to Frank's thorough analysis of the analog board inside the CRT, this is actually the design of the CRT board that allows that dot to happen. And it's not a failure in this monitor. 
Frank is going to have a more thorough video on this problem and the solution on his channel. So check the description below. I'll put a link directly to that. So don't forget to check that out if you're interested in even more theory on this. But Frank has provided me with a fix that I can do to my monitor that will eliminate this problem. Let's implement it now. First step is to get the analog board out of the monitor so we can do the modification. It's telling me here to refer to qualified personnel before opening the monitor. Does that include me? Hmm. Getting this board out of the CRT requires removing it from the computer, which I have done. There are two metal standoffs here and here, which require taking a screw off the underside of the monitor, which is just not possible when it's mounted on the computer. And then towards the front of the monitor, there are two more standoffs, which are plastic with little clips. And one is here and one is under this side. And you have to squeeze them with a pair of needle nose to pop them out and then you can get the whole board out. And there we go with a little fiddling. I've been able to remove this. Now my very dusty board is still connected to the CRT both through the high voltage line with, and the anode cap on the CRT itself and the deflection yoke which has these four wires which are permanently attached to the monitor. So I'd have to completely remove the deflection yoke if I wanted to pull this out entirely. But I think I'm just gonna do the modification like so without taking out any further than this. Here's the diagram that Frank has sent me to try to fix the dot on my monitor. What he's saying here is that R2, which is a resistor on the board, needs to be removed, and we're gonna be installing a Zener diode 8.2 volts and a 510 ohm resistor, or thereabouts, in place of R2. One side of it is the 12 volt side, and one side is the diode side. There's some other diodes on the board. And he did mention that I do not need this 100 nanofarad capacitor, and I shouldn't even bother with that. So I am going to omit that. So taking a look at the analog board, there are no silkscreen markings whatsoever on here. So how could I possibly figure out where R2 is? Well, luckily on Zimmers.net, there is a scan from probably the original service manual, which shows the component layout of everything on this board. I'm gonna rotate this around because this is gonna match the orientation of the board right there. And right by my left thumb is R2. It's a 2.2K resistor. And if you remember from Frank's diagram, he said one side of my new little Zener diode and resistor connection is gonna go on the 12 volt side. I have written 12 volts right there on the left side of this R2 resistor and the diode side is on this side. I already connected an 8.2 volt Zener and the resistor together, I used a 470. In this case, I didn't have a 510. And you look at the orientation of this, this matches his diagram where the 12 volt side is on the left and the diode side is on the right, which is exactly what's going on here. 12 volt side here is on the left, diode side is on the right. Based on the component layer from the service manual, that is the resistor right there, kind of hidden behind this heatsink. Sorry, the camera angle is not so great. This is where I'm gonna be installing the Zener diode and the 470 ohm resistor. And there is the diode and the resistor installed. Hopefully you're able to see that and it's in focus on the camera, but that's where R2 was. And that's where I've installed the new parts according to Frank's diagram. Okay, we're ready for testing. The analog board is all connected to the PET. Power and video signal come through the top here. Everything looks pre pretty precarious. Don't worry, the monitor is not ready to fall off the table. It's, it's okay. And let's turn it on for the first time. Will something blow or will it work? Hopefully it just works. Let's see, okay, we have an image. And now for the moment of truth, when I turn it off, will we get the spot? We still get the spot, oh dear. Well, clearly, as you just saw, the spot fix didn't actually fix the spot, at least on my pet. That doesn't mean Frank's spot fix is bad. It actually did work for him, but there's something else going on on my pet. So I'm gonna dig into what that is in the next video. If you enjoyed this video, I'd appreciate a thumbs up, but if you didn't, you know what to do. You can hit that thumbs down button, hit that subscribe button to subscribe to my channel and the little notification bell icon to be notified on your phone when I upload new videos. Put your comments and your suggestions down in the comment section below, and that's gonna be it. Stay healthy, stay safe, 
and I'll see you next time. Goodbye.